Okay, it is now seven o'clock um, and I would like to welcome you all here today to our Beyond Gas Advocacy Workshop. Uh, my name is Anne Keery. I'm a member of Climate Fast. I'm also a member of For Our Kids Toronto and a member of um, TCAN, the Toronto Climate Action Network. Uh, so I'm stepping in today for Lynn Adamson, who couldn't make it for health reasons. So if you're watching, Lynn, uh, we wish you the best and a speedy recovery, and we're all sending our love to you. Um, so I hope you are receiving it. Um, this workshop this evening is the kickoff event for the Beyond Gas campaign, which is being organised by the Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign with uh, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, Climate Fast, Citizens Climate Lobby Ontario, and Green Neighbours Network. So this is a powerful group of organisations. The Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign, if you haven't heard of it, um, I'm imagining most people on the call here today have, is a coalition of over 250 groups representing about 850,000 Ontarians advocating for a safe climate future for all. Um, and this campaign is critical. This Beyond Gas campaign is critical if we are to secure that. As you know, the Ford government is planning on ramping up gas-fired power plants that will increase carbon emissions by up to 700 percent by 2040 and make it, making it impossible for Ontario to meet its emissions reduction targets, as well as negatively impacting the health of our communities. There is no need for this. There are alternatives. A future powered by clean, renewable energy is possible, and we're going to be learning about that, and we're going to be learning how to advocate for it. Um, so we have a full agenda. Um, Shortly, I will be turning to Val uh, for our land acknowledgement. Then we'll be hearing from Angela Bischoff from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. Then we'll turn to Cheryl McNamara from the Canadian Citizens Climate Lobby. There'll be a Q&A session after that. And for those who can stay on, we will have some a 15-minute breakout sessions um, starting at 8 o'clock. But we understand that not everyone uh, will be able to stay for that. We do have some housekeeping rules. Um, so first of all, please uh, respect each other and listen with an open mind. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. We'll have a chat monitor um, collecting the questions. Um, if we've missed something or if you're having any problem, please contact a tech person who will be identified with a tech in front of their name. So that's for the technical uh, issues that you're, you might be dealing with. Um, but if you have questions just about what you're hearing, please put those in the chat. Uh, the workshop is being recorded in the main Zoom room, but not in the breakout rooms afterwards. And we don't have uh, closed captioning available, unfortunately, for this evening. So with that, again, uh, a warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming for this incredibly important campaign. And I will now turn to Val Endicott from Climate Fast and the Ontario Clean Air Alliance for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Val. We acknowledge the sacred land on which we live and meet today. This land and its beings have been cared for by diverse First Nations people for many thousands of years. Most recently here in Toronto, this includes the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa and Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca and the Petun First Nations. Today we're party to Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Those of us tuning in from anywhere in the Great Lakes Basin are invited to share and care for the land and living beings through the hundreds of years old dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. This land is still home to many diverse First Nations, Innu and Métis peoples, and we recognize the marginalization of Indigenous peoples, and we pledge our collective efforts to remedy this colonial legacy. In preparing this land acknowledgement, I spent much of the day researching more fully the contentious ring of fire issue uh, in Northern Ontario. We have all heard that this area contains precious metals and minerals that we will need for a clean energy future, in particular, to fuel our electric vehicles. We have also heard that while two First Nations in the area are on board with building a road to prepare for the mining, at least five others aren't. 
Chiefs of those other communities were in Toronto just last week and they were refused an audience with Ford. As part of my research, I watched a recent episode of The Agenda on TVO. The discussion seemed primarily focused on one proposed mine and it was described by a proponent as, quote, a mere pinprick on the back of an elephant in terms of the disturbance it might cause. What was glaringly missing from the discussion, and I've let Steve Pakin know, is that one mine leads to another. And according to the Ontario government's own calculations, there are about 26,167 active mining claims in that area as of a year ago. If resource develop and development is not done according to the UN's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, seeking their free, prior and informed consent, ours will not be a just clean energy future. And it will be quite rightly blocked, as we see in the case of the Wet'suwet'en struggle in BC. Upholding Indigenous sovereignty and following their leadership is a must as we work for a clean energy future here in Ontario and elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you, Val. Um, I really appreciated that land acknowledgement. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce Angela Bischoff from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. Angela has worked with the environmental nonprofit sector for more than three decades in four Canadian cities, working on issues ranging from eco cities, transportation, climate, mental health and elections. She knows what she's talking about. She is the director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, a small but mighty group aiming to move Ontario onto a 100% renewable path. Angela also practices and teaches yoga, commutes daily by bike, and cares for her aging mother. Thank you, Angela. I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Anne, and everybody who helped organize this event. And I hope Lynn's here to watch. Yeah, so I work with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. We're a small NGO uh, that focus on Ontario electricity issues. We were founded in, in uh, 1997 to call for the coal phase out. And since winning that campaign, we turned our attention more broadly to moving Ontario to 100% renewable electricity grid. I'm gonna move really quickly with a lot of information. Okay, to set the context, you know that the IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just released their recent synthesis report after seven years of study and research. And they said we really need to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by almost 50% by 2030 in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So this is like serious, we gotta start reducing today. Uh, the feds, they have likewise committed to 40 to 45% GHG reductions by 2030. But very importantly, I want to draw your attention to their commitment to moving Canada to 100% net zero electricity grid by 2035. We're going to come back to that. The Ontario government is committed to less ambit ambitious emissions, 30% by 2030, though they have made zero progress. Um, Catherine McKenna, she was our federal environment minister for many years, and she now works for the United Nations high level expert group on climate change. She recently and you know, on behalf of this uh, expert group, they said new fossil fuel based electricity generation should not be permitted. Now let's see what Doug Ford is doing got elected in 2018 and scratched renewable energy programs, cancelled outright 758 renewable energy projects, cut the conservation budget by 60%, uh, directed the IESO, the independent electricity system operator, to build new peak power plants. 1,500 megawatts right now is a, um, a request for proposals they're prepared to buy. Um, increasing the, the output of our existing uh, gas plants by more than 700% by 2043. This is their plan. This is their energy plan. Rebuilding very high cost aging nuclear reactors, Bruce and Darlington, considering rebuilding the Pickering nuclear station after very many constant extensions, 
and they want to build a new nuclear reactor uh, at Darlington in the GTA, very high cost. Okay, so we're just going to focus on gas in this presentation today. In 2017, when Doug, well, Doug Ford came in in 2018, but at that time, the Liberal government had dramatically been reducing our greenhouse gas emissions from our electricity sector. They'd ramped up renewables dramatically such that Ontario had more wind and solar than any other province in the country. They invested massively in conservation, reducing demand for gas power. And at the time, our electricity grid only got 4% of our electricity from fossil fuels and gas. By 2023, we've more than tripled the output of our existing gas plants. And by 2043, it'll be 700% rise. So this is really taking us backward at a time when the whole world is moving forward toward a renewable future. Ontario municipalities did not agree with this direction that Doug Ford was taking the province. They all, you know, Ontario municipalities have all signed, or most have signed climate emergency declarations. And 34 Ontario municipalities in the last two years signed resolutions. And those 34 municipalities include, you know, Toronto, Ottawa, Hamilton, Windsor, Kingston, all the big Ontario municipalities representing 60% of Ontario's population, they signed resolutions calling for the gas plant pollution to return back to the 2017 levels and to achieve a complete, complete gas power phase out by 2030. But what did Doug Ford? No, he's sticking with his old plans. He's representing the gas and nuclear lobbies and he's not interested in the real future of power around the world, which is renewable power. Let's look at what's happening with renewables globally. 16 countries and states are already powered by 100% renewables. Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Kenya, South Dakota, and 10 more. 62 more countries are committed to moving to 100% renewable electricity future. And then uh, let's just, like Canada, we get, our national peak uh, usage is 150 megawatts um, across the country. So it took us 100 years to roll out 150 megawatts. That's how much we use in all the provinces. So just last year alone, six of the global solar panel manufacturers produced enough panels to produce 300,000 megawatts. So that's double Canada's uh, peak power needs. This is the direction of power around the world. And those panels are all ordered and to be erected by 2025, they can be rolled up that quickly. Wind and solar um, plants can be rolled out in one to two years. We, and then by comparison, wind power around the world, it's the same thing. It's just growing exponentially. It already currently provides a million megawatts globally. So if someone says wind and solar don't work, like it's just, it's absolutely nonsensical. The world is moving there. And it's because the prices are coming down so dramatically for wind and solar because they're built on an assembly line and there's millions of them being cranked out. The prices come down, the replication brings the price down. So you know, and as the price lowers, countries just jump right into it. And this year alone, a, you a one trillion dollars is what the global green power capital investment is estimated to be. So the world is going in this direction. Let's look at Ontario's electricity options, how much they cost, what our options are. Let's I'll draw your attention to the bar in the middle at nine cents, the gray bar. That's what, that's the fuel and carbon tax cost of gas power in Ontario in 2030. So as the gas um, carbon tax gets ramped up, that's what we'll be paying. Now on the left, the farthest left is energy efficiency, the IESO, Independent Electricity System Operator, our provincial body that purchases electricity. This is what they say conservation costs. This is what they're paying for conservation efficiency. That's our lowest cost way. That's how we reduce our electricity bills by reducing our demand 
Now, Doug Ford cut that budget by 60%, but that's our best uh, way to meet our needs. Quebec water power, we already have the grid between the provinces. The federal government has incentivized in the recent uh, federal budget, more interprovincial trade. Quebec has lots of surplus water power and storage. And we, and the, what's, what's Ford doing? He's not renewing one of the current contracts that we have that uh, um, when, it, when it comes to the end of its life. So uh, he doesn't like renewables, clearly. Solar, three to six cents. This is what Lazard said in 2021. Lazard is, you know, a, a financial investment company and um, they are claiming, well, in fact, Alberta is buying solar at I think three cents a kilowatt hour. So if, if Ontario wanted to build out solar farms, it'd be three to five cents. If they wanted to build out onshore wind farms, it would be three to six cents. That's what other provinces are paying for wind power. You know, Ontario is choosing instead the gas uh, direction. And then the, the 10.9 cents, the first uh, yellow bar, that's what we pay for nuclear power at Darlington and Pickering. So, you know, that's twice the price than if we were to build, you know, just do water power from Quebec, for example, or to build wind and solar farms, which would take one to two years. And then offshore wind, right now, Lazard says 11 cents. Again, those prices are coming down. The prices for wind and solar are coming down dramatically. Well, the prices for nuclear are going up. Look at the 13.7. That's what we're that's what OPG says we're going to have to pay them in 2027 for the for their electricity because they're rebuilding Darlington. So, you know, again, prices going up. And the 16.3 cents, that's what industry says best case scenario, the new SMR small modular reactor is going to cost at um Darlington, if it ever gets built, if it ever opens, it's that's, you know, 10 to 15 years versus wind and solar, which are a fraction of the cost and one to two years. And the last bar at 20 to 26 cents, that's what peaking power, gas peaking power costs. So we're going the most expensive route. We think there's a great untapped potential to have uh, wind farms on our Great Lakes. Um, in uh, a decade ago, the government of Ontario hired a company uh, to research what the potential would be for wind power on the Great Lakes, and they identified 64 sites, which, all told, could produce 80% of Ontario's electricity demand. Imagine, now the feds have incentivized with through tax credits for offshore wind on the coasts. We could put offshore wind in the Great Lakes. Uh, so we think we need to rescind that moratorium on offshore wind power in the Great Lakes. So we're going for gas. This is what Doug Ford is doing. These are the communities in Southern Ontario that already have some gas generation. And these are the communities that we suspect will be targeted for gas expansion whether it's new plants or expanded existing plants. Um, if you live in any of these 10 communities, please, well, regardless whether you do or not, please go to nomoregasplants.ca. This is an environmental defense campaign page, and they're focusing on these municipalities. They're building support in these municipalities to get people to lobby those local councillors to uh, advance uh, preemptive resolutions saying we do not want gas expansion on our communities. So please go there if you live in any of those communities. But clearly we just can't rely on the province to make climate smart decisions. We can't rely on them to make economically smart decisions either. I mean, they're representing different interests. They're not at representing the environment and they're not uh, representing taxpayers. So we really think now we have to step it up and go to the feds and ask the feds to implement these clean, within their clean electricity regulations to, to implement a ban on gas. The federal government does have jurisdiction over climate emissions. They won that in a recent carbon tax Supreme Court um, case. 
And so the feds can step in here and prevent Ontario from going in this direction. The, the, the feds are producing these clean electricity regulations uh, in, within their goal of moving on to Canada to a uh, carbon zero electricity grid by 2035. The first draft is expected in June, after which you and I will have an opportunity to give input into that draft. But prior to that draft coming out, we're putting the pressure on Jagmeet Singh and, and um, Justin Trudeau to say those electricity regulations, that, that draft, should prohibit the building of new gas plants in Ontario effective immediately. We don't want any loopholes in those clean electricity regs allowing Doug Ford to get away with building up a bunch of gas plants right away before the 2025 timeline or something. That's what we're worried about. And we want these regs to require Ontario to move to a net carbon, a net zero carbon electricity grid by 2030. It would be relatively easy for Ontario to do that, much easier than the other provinces. Think back that that, that graph I showed you, 2017, only 4% of our electricity grid was fossil fueled. And so it would be relatively easy compared to other provinces which have a majority of their electricity coming from gas or coal. So to learn more about this clean electricity regulations um, push, everything is on this page, cleaneralliance.org slash letters to Prime Minister Trudeau. So you'll see draft letters that you could give to your MPP or your MP to send to Trudeau. There's a letter there that you can send more information about those clean electricity regs. Now we're asking all of you to participate by reaching out to your city councillors, your MPPs, your members of provincial parliament, or your MPs, your members of parliament. You have a represent, every riding has all of three of those. And we want you to ask them for a, for a meeting or, you know, and in the meeting request, you can put the information. So even if they don't give you a meeting, all the information's there, you're reaching out to them about your concerns about this gas ramp up. We're asking, uh, we're, so in those meetings, we would ask them to oppose new gas plant proposals in their local communities, to support strong clean electricity regulations at the federal level, and to support a 100% renewable energy future. Very specifically, when you're, if you're meeting with your municipal councillors, you're asking them to advance a preemptive resolution opposing new gas propo proposals and to communicate with their federal and provincial counterparts. With your MPPs, you're asking them to tell the Ford government to support a gas phase up, make it an issue, and ask their party leader to speak out on the issue. For example, we haven't heard from Merritt Stiles. Where does she stand on the gas plant ramp up? Until the party leaders take it on, it's not really a party issue. And also for, the, for your MPs to push their caucus leaders to press for those clean regs. You can reach out to me privately, Angela at Clean Air Alliance. This is our gas campaigns page, cleanairalliance.org campaigns gas. The no new gas plants.ca allows you to send a letter to your provincial and federal uh, leaders or representatives calling for um, clean electricity regs. Thank you very much. I'm here to, for, to answer questions later. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, there's a lot of information there. It's a really important campaign. And I do believe that the slides uh, will be shared um, with everyone who is here today. So if you didn't catch it all, you will have an opportunity to look through the information later. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Cheryl McNamara. Uh, Cheryl is a climate and human rights activist, communicator, and playwright. She is the Communications and Advocacy Coordinator for Kairos Canada, a national ecumenical human and ecological rights organization. In 2011, she founded the Toronto chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a volunteer-driven international organization that builds political will for a livable planet. Since that time, Cheryl has lobbied more than 100 provincial and federal parliamentarians, US lawmakers, the World Bank and Canadian Embassy in the US to put a price on carbon. 
She has also met with the editorial boards of prominent newspapers, and her op-eds have appeared in the Toronto Star, the Ottawa Citizen, and Huffington Post. Her play for young audiences, Water Wonder, about our deep connection to nature, was part of Carousel Players 2019-2020 season. So over to you, Cheryl. I can think of no one more qualified to teach us how to lobby effectively. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you to Angela for that really informative presentation. So I am here to go over lobbying best practices uh, using citizens climate lobbies method. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give a very, very brief overview of citizens climate lobby. So citizens climate lobby or CCL is a nonpartisan nonprofit grassroots uh, advocacy organization focus on national pol policies to address the climate crisis. It began 16 years ago and it now has 537 active chapters worldwide. Uh, in Canada, we were very successful in getting the government to adopt a carbon pricing mechanism similar to what we lobbied for, which is rise, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a rising price on carbon uh, rebated to households. So next slide, please. So one of the most effective ways to uh, engage with elected officials is by having a meeting with them. Um, and that face-to-face -face discussion can give you a, a lot of mileage in uh, advancing your, uh, sorry, um, your advocacy asks. So uh, here's what we're going to learn how to do. Secure an appointment with your elected uh, representatives, uh, prepare yourself for the meeting and practice lobbying a politician. Next slide. So at CCL, we have a, a very important rule when lobbying, and that is to demonstrate respect for the elected re representative. Now, of course, being respectful is important when meeting with anybody, but I just want to flag this particularly. In 2017, a poll from Insights West found that politics is the least respected profession. Only 24% of the people polled had a high to somewhat high opinion of politicians. Car salesmen are viewed slightly more favorably. And you know what, I get it. Uh, before I began volunteering with Citizens Climate Lobby, I too had a very unfavorable view of politicians. But in meeting with them, my views really changed. Many of the people I met across the political spectrum are passionate about making a difference. There are exceptions, of course, but I found that many are, to, are usually smart, professional, and, and they're kind. And consider, too, that many of them, especially women, are dealing with a lot of abuse from the public. It is a tough and quite often a thankless job. So imagine being in their shoes. And, and I'm going to ask you, how would you respond to somebody who speaks to you disdainfully or who yells at you? And... How would you respond to somebody who speaks uh, to you with respect, who tells you that they appreciate the work that you are doing, who listens to you and, and who respects your time? Would you be more open to hear what they had to say? And would you be more inclined to meet with them again? So, and I think the answer is yes. <laughs> so the, the crux to this work, of course, is relationship building. And that is always founded on respect. Next slide, please. So where to begin? Well, the first step is to find out more about the elected official with whom you'd like to meet. Uh, this could be your own representative or somebody who has a portfolio that includes the environment or natural resources. So visit their website. Um, usually there's an about section and to find out more details about them, even if they're a father, that sort of thing, or a mother. Um, are they interested in the environment? You know, are they interested in something that you can make a climate connection? For example, if they are interested in affordability, you can point out that the climate change is fueled by, uh, in, by uh, sorry, uh, food insecurity, um, for example. Um, and of course, when you're dealing with the gas plants, you can certainly say that, you know, going with gas fired plants is, is the least affordable approach. Um, are they a parent or a grandparent? And can you relate to them in that way? And or do they even go to the same school? So find out any kind of aspect of them, like if they if they're in the same profession, for, or 
formally before they became a, a politician if, if they were in the same prof profession as you. Um, so you can also check their social media feeds. Uh, and if you're a meeting, say, with your MPP, you can go to the Legislative Assembly website to learn more about uh, what actions uh, they took in the legislature. Uh, if you're meeting with an MP, you go to Open Parliament. Um, so is there also, if there is something that they initiated or supported that you can sincerely thank them for, and that's important. Um, it's really important to be uh, sincere. And I have to say, I have planned meetings with Republicans in the United States and trying to come up with some appreciation. And at times, I tell you, it was very challenging, but we did manage. So I recommend that you compile what you learned in a one to two page dossier and share it with your group. That's a great way to help you prepare for your meeting. Uh, include the contact details, including that of the staffer with whom you're communicating. So the next slide, please. So when you're securing a meeting with a with an elected official, you want to call the constituency office and, and, and send an email. Typically, when you call, the staffer will ask you to send them an email detailing who you are and the purpose of the meeting. I like to send the email first and follow up with a call to ask if they received it. Um, and so this template that you see uh, to help you frame what to say in a, in a phone call uh, can be applied to an email too. And you may want to open with an appreciation for the elected official um, in this initial correspondence or not, it's up to you. Um, identify yourself if you're a constituent and your group and that you want to meet with a representative about Ontario's gas plants. So the next slide. So when you call, ask for the person who schedules the representative's meetings. It may be the person that you're actually speaking to. The staffers are typically professional and courteous, uh, and if you hit it off with them, um, that's great. It's a great way to hone a good relationship with the staffer. Uh, you may need to leave a voicemail and follow up with an email if you did not send one prior. Remember to identify yourself as a constituent if you are one. Um, if you are not a constituent, then of course mention that you are meeting them in the capacity, in the in whatever capacity the role is, um, uh, such as you know sitting on an environment committee. And of course, mention the group that you're with. Um, as the focus uh, lobbying will take place in May, um, providing deadlines to, uh, to respond is not a bad idea. Do follow up though. If you do not hear in a week, call again. Try also uh, the, the official's legislative office. So it could be in Ottawa or uh, Toronto or uh, at uh, City Hall. Um, sometimes uh, you get better luck doing it that way, uh, but don't give up. Uh, and if your representative that you want to meet with is an actual minister, you might have better luck securing a meeting with their policy advisor. Um, so uh, next slide. So one effective tool that CCL members use in meeting is called motivational interviewing. It's a communication style that fosters collaboration and offers advocate skills to uh, collaborate with anyone, even those that may not agree with you. Uh, it also helps people find common ground. And a key part of this um, uh, is honing exceptional listening skills. People love you when they feel that, that you are really listening to them. And by asking open-ended questions and listening, you are going to learn so much more um, than what you've actually gleaned in all the research. So uh, an open-ended question uh, are who, what, where, and when questions. Avoid why questions, which can come up as, as provocative. Uh, and here's one example um, of, of an open-ended question. When you think of Ontario's energy profile by 2030 and 2040, what does it look like? By asking that, that would kind of open them up to kind of consider that. And, you know, maybe if they see, you know, you know, I, um, you know, gas plants is in the future, then, you know, maybe you can bring up issues like affordability. But at any rate, listen to what they have to say. Um, it helps you in, it helps inform you of how to better respond to them. And, uh, and when we think of meeting with politicians, we sometimes feel that we need to do most of the talking, um, telling the politician what they should be doing. So CCL's approach is, is different. Uh, we want to hear from the representative too, which can inform next steps, as I said, in our strategy. And it's also a good way to establish a trusting relationship with, with the person. So the next slide. 
So in preparing for your meeting um, with your group, uh, you will assign roles. So this is, you know, when, you're, when you know, say you've set the meeting, which is great, and, um, and you need to prepare, um, uh, you're going to want to sit down and as assign some roles. I think um, you're probably going to already have a lobby lead. Um, and this might be the person who initiated, who was able to secure the call. Um, there's a lot of roles here, as you can see, but, um, and depending on the size of your group, you'll probably have to double up on roles. So here are, here are, some, here are the key roles. So uh, a lobby lead, and of course, this is a person who stick handles the preparations. They may help kick off the meeting with the elected official uh, or not. Uh, this person facilitates the allocation of roles and makes sure that everybody's kept abreast. Uh, the appreciator. This is somebody who thanks the representative for something they did specifically, uh, and it's always a good idea to have a constituent do that. The time monitor. Um, so as a way of demonstrating respect for the politician, we, we like to respect their time. Uh, and this person asks the official how much time for the meeting. It's usually half an hour, and they give a time check of about five minutes towards the end. The note taker. So all the rules are very important. The note taker, especially so. They, um, the meeting notes are going to help inform strategy. And the more detailed they are, the better. And the person should be very good at taking notes and well versed on the issue. You know, sometimes we get people who say, oh, oh I don't know much or I'm, I'm new to lobbying, so I'm going to take notes. Um, and uh, so long as they're a really good note taker, that's great. But I've been in meetings where somebody's volunteered to take the notes and I look across and they're not taking any notes. And it's like, oh, God, OK, well, I better start <laughs> taking the notes because it's so important. Um, so in terms of the discussion, uh, roles around discussion, this is where you ask the, uh, the specific open-ended questions. Um, and you can assign maybe three people uh, to ask specific questions. The asker, the asker is somebody who makes the asks, obviously, uh, and the asks are specific specifically what you want the representative to do. And Angela gave a very good job of outlining um, all of them um, around opposing new glass, um, gas plant proposals, support for strong, clean electricity regulations, and support for 100% uh, renewable energy future. And there's details within that. Um, so the deliverer, the next job is the person who uh, is going to provide the lead behind document. This is usually the same person as the asker. So the lead behind is a two page document that outlines the ass. And this document is currently under development. You all will receive it. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the asker is usually the deliverer. Follow up. Um, this person follows up with a representative with a thank you card and any resources that may have been promised in the course of the meeting. Uh, the person is typically the one who sets up the meeting. So there's the one, they're the one who set up that or started the, initiated that relationship with, with the representative. It's always good to uh, assign a photographer as well, tasking one person to be responsible, to remember to take a photo of, of the representative in the group um, that you can share on social media, for example, especially if you had a really good meeting with them. Um, and this, if you're in a Zoom conference or Zoom uh, meeting, you can, be the person to to hit uh, print screen um and then uh and then the last but not least role um is the observer and um you know when you want to ask somebody at least one person to observe the representative's body language um so if you are new to lobbying and a bit nervous about it this is a great job uh, and it can be very very informative and so when we do a regroup after the meeting um usually that person will you know go, this is the sense that i got from this person so it can, it can be really it can be very much uh, informative um, when they open up, when they kind of <laughs> step back. You know, it's just it's good to to uh, to keep an eye on that. Uh, the next slide, please. So, how should a meeting with a representative unfold? At Citizens Climate Lobby, we like to follow a basic meeting outline, and it goes something like this: the group lead thanks the representative for taking the time to meet. The timekeeper asks how much time we have with them. Inspect half an hour, but sometimes it could be shorter. So adjust what you have to say accordingly. We briefly introduce ourselves, go around, say your names, and in one sentence while you're there, it could be something on the lungs of very simply, I'm, my name is Cheryl McNamara, and I'm very concerned. I'm here because I'm really concerned about the climate crisis, and I'm concerned about um, uh, the future of the energy future in, in Ontario. 
Um, it could also be something like, um, you know, I want this city uh, to transition to clean energy so that I can leave a stable um, climate to my children. But be brief, of course, um, someone, likely a constituent, though as I mentioned before, it doesn't need to be, thanks the representative for something they've done, a bill that they worked uh, on or uh, voted in, in favor for, something they championed or something they did for the riding. Somebody, likely the group lead, tells the rep why uh, we're there and offers a brief summary of the ask. Now, if you don't have time, then you're going to need to delve right into the ask. If you do have that time, if you have at least a half an hour, then uh, let the representative know that before we delve into the ask, we'd like to know your thoughts on dot, dot, dot. And this is where you launch into your open-ended questions and let the representative talk. Listen attentively. Questions may naturally arise. Feel free to ask them. It's important to empathize with the representative, um, what they're telling you. If the, if the representative is committed to uh, gas fire plants because of affordability, well, you know what to tell them. <laughs> you can let them know that affordability is really important to you. And that is why you want the fate, you don't want the gas fire plants. You, you actually, you know, want the province to transition fully 100% to renewable energy. Um, so the idea is to, um, to pivot, you know, go to where the representative is. Yes, I agree with you. That's an important issue for me too, but guide them towards your position. Um, so by 20, sorry, 15 or 20 minutes, um, um, that's when you want to present your ask and provide the lead behind. Um, the time may, keeper might come in. If, if you know you're in a great conversation and they know that we only have half an hour, they might come in and say, hey, I think we should, uh, you know, um, present the ask. Um, and the representative may ask questions. And if, if they ask a question that no one in your group knows, you know, that's okay. Um, let them know that you'll find out and get back to them. It's one more opportunity to keep that relationship going. Um, that could be uh, one of your follow-ups. Uh, the representative may offer to do something for you. Ask them when you should follow up for them on that. Um, so five minutes towards the end of the meeting, the timekeeper should note the time, especially if the meeting is not naturally wrapping up. Arrange for a photo. Uh, if it's a Zoom call, the photographer can ask for a photo and press the, the print screen, as I mentioned. Um, and then, of course, thank the representative for their time. And finally, this is just an outline, right? It's just a guide. Uh, the representative could throw a, you a curveball letting you know your time with them is limited. So, you know, you have to, you have to come in with your ass right away, or they can ask you a whole bunch of questions um, or start going on to about some other unrelated subject. So rather than be stressed by it, go with the flow and, um, you know, you either launch into your ass right away or you gently pivot back to, to, you know, what you want to say or what you want to hear from them. So uh, the next slide, I'm just going to wrap up. Um, if you are um, with a group that is new to lobbying uh, and are nervous about it, you can practice by role playing a meeting. Um, you'll have to assign someone as the representative who you plan to meet. If you're meeting with someone who you may not agree with, who may you, who you feel you may not agree with your position, um, um, then, uh, you know, think of challenging questions they may ask you to help you better um, prepare your response. And, and just a final word, word. Um, for any of you who are new to lobbying, may be a little nervous about it. I have met with, as, as is mentioned, you know, a lot of elected officials and their staff, uh, including Republicans in the United States. And in all that time, I have had only just a few cool receptions, probably two. The vast majority of my encounters have been really friendly and informative. Uh, representatives, for the most part, love meeting with us um, and uh, they're certainly their constituents and, and others who are really passionate about uh, making a difference, making the world a better place. So remember that meeting with the uh, with constituents is part of their job. Uh, you may struggle uh, securing a meeting with conservatives. That happens. Um, just be persistent. And remember, when meeting with people who do not see eye to eye with you, show appreciation, showing appreciation for what they do can go a long way. Um, so just keep that in mind when you are role playing and planning a meeting. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, that was incredibly informative and really valuable advice. Um, so I'm sure many people here will be watching the recording of you taking us through those steps um, several times as they prepare for their meetings. So thank you. I'd now like to introduce uh, Liz Addison from Climate Fast, who is going to be um, ch chairing our Q&A session. And I'd also like to bring back Angela. Angela, you're there. So over to you, Liz. Hi. Uh, OK, so I've tried to uh, keep track of the, um, the questions that you put in the chat. I've tried to condense them down. Um, if you feel that um, I'm not capturing what you were asking, uh, please just put that in the chat as well and somebody will inform me. Um, okay, so I'm not always sure who to ask these questions of, but I'm gonna start with uh, one for Angela. Um, one of the participants is very concerned about uh, fugitive uh, methane from fracking. Um, and uh, Angela, you've indicated that in the chat, in response to his questions, that 80% uh, of gas in North America is fracked. Could you comment on the issue of fugitive methane? How big a problem is it? Um, what data is there on methane leaks from Ontario's aging gas pipelines? I don't have that data, um, Liz okay. or Lowell. Yeah, 80% of gas burned in North America is fracked. In Ontario, we don't frack and we don't have any gas reserves here. At least we don't uh, mine it. We get our gas from the Pennsylvania basin as well as from Western Canada. So when Doug Ford says he doesn't want to buy Quebec water power, because he doesn't want, you know, he wants it to be a local resourced uh, industry. Well, we're getting our, our gas from Western Canada and from Pennsylvania. So we are, you know, it's kind of a bogus argument they use. Um, but yeah, fugitive emissions are a really big problem. And methane is a really big problem. It, uh, it's, yeah, many times more CO2 intensive than coal. Um, like, is it 80 times more, I think? Plus then there's a fugitive emissions. Like it's a really big issue that, you know, we don't see it. So we think it's not, it's, it's not there. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on fugitive emissions. What I'm wondering is, is, is it a valid point to bring up in the lobbying effort? Absolutely. It's very okay. dirty. Okay, and, that's great. And, and, you know, lots of politicians will say, well, natural gas is clean. But first of all, we don't use the term natural. There's nothing more natural about it than there is coal or oil. It's a fossil, a dirty fossil fuel. It contributes uh, toxics to the environment. It might be cleaner than coal, but the GHG profile is because it, uh, it's 80 times more intensive than coal. It stays in the atmosphere for a shorter period of time, super intensive. And um, yeah, we can still call it dirty gas or fossil gas. Do not call it natural gas. That is industry spin. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see now. And uh, here's one for Cheryl. Um, would you recommend meetings in groups or individually? I groups, absolutely groups. Um, it's great to have groups. Um, I've been in a meeting um, by myself once and I would not recommend it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's just, you're going to feel more comfortable. Um, you, um, you can kind of share the load as well. And it also demonstrates, especially if there's constituents around that, you know, that there are constituents, uh, more constituents in, 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 you know, the riding or wherever they are that um, are, you know, feel passionate about this issue. So, um, I mean, hey, if this is your only opportunity, or if you have a really super great relationship with this, uh, this person, then, um, Sure. I mean, it's going to depend, but I I would say definitely try and get a group together. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I'm not sure who to ask the next question to. Do municipalities have the power legally to prevent Enbridge or whoever's doing the um, the supply of, of the gas, um, prevent them from laying pipelines in their towns? Is there any municipal servicing that these new gas plants need that municipalities could deny? Ah, I think I'm not, I'm not positive unless there's someone in the on the meeting, but I know that there that municipalities can they, there's way maybe they can't say no, but they can make it uneasy for Enbridge. But I'm sorry, I can't respond to that. I, I'm happy to find out that answer and send it out in the follow up notes. That I just wonder. Great. I just wonder about that. That's a really great question. Um, but given the power that this that provinces have over municipalities, I'm just wondering if I, I I hear what Angela says about making it difficult, but I wonder if Ontario would have kind of the you know the power to override that. I seem to recall, uh, maybe it was a hallucination, but but uh, I seem to recall that there was uh, a regulation that said that the cities or the municipalities had to agree to have the plants. Isn't that correct? Uh, sorry, Angela. Yes, so the municipal, so to build or expand the gas plants, this is a, I was, thinking about gas lines for for servicing housing, for example, with the last question you asked. But in terms of the gas plants, the, the, the province has said that they need municipal or local First Nation uh, support for the gas expansion. And that is exactly why environmental defense is planning in those 10 communities to build opposition. Uh huh. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and I see there's a notice, uh, a note in the chat that says municipalities have to agree. So, yeah. Um, also, uh, a related question: Most Enbridge pipelines require approval through the Ontario Energy Board. Um, any municipality or individual can participate in that process. Is there a specific pipeline or area that you're wondering about that you're really targeting in in your campaign uh, we're targeting the policy overall environmental mm -hmm. defense will be targeting uh, the municipal well i mean for example as soon as we hear about uh, an expansion plan we will move into the municipality and put our pressure on it um, environmental defense is being a bit more is more proactive because we don't know what those municipalities are. The projects haven't been proposed. There was one proposed for Windsor, and as soon as we heard about it, we all jumped in and started uh, trying to influence the local city council to say no. But it it all happened in one week. We didn't have time to build local opposition. So. They're smart. They're moving really quickly. And in the end, the council voted to support it. So that was the first proposal that's been put forward and the council supported it. But uh, yeah, so we need to we need to be more proactive. And that's what environmental defense is leading. OK, and uh, I think that's just the one last question, which is um, why do you think Merritt Stiles hasn't mentioned climate or the gas plants in her identified priorities that's a good question i you know we've tried to meet with her she hasn't meet she hasn't agreed to or her staff haven't agreed like we want to meet about this very issue and her staff have not agreed to meet with us so you know it's they her team it's the same with andrea horvath like their team never felt like the environmental issues were as important as you know healthcare and uh, the green belt and whatever the, you know, where they're hearing from the public, that's where they're going to. So it that's what our job here as lobbyists 
is to make it an issue that merit styles cannot ignore. So that's our job. Um, so th this was not uh, from the chat, but this is my own question, which is, um, if the politicians are following the lead of the public and the public aren't hearing this, what is being done to make the public more aware of the issue? Well, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance has a huge database and we send out bulletins every week. And if mm -hmm. you're not already on, I invite you to, well, if you s were to sign that no new gas plants .ca, mm -hmm. if you went there and sent a letter, then I will add you to our, our ongoing bulletin. So we're, like we're creating our own media um, by you know, informing the public and giving them action tools. That's what we can do. And other environmental groups are doing the same thing. And, you know, we're regularly sending all this information to the media and we're dependent on them to, you know, write the stories that get our side of the story out there as well as, you know, the Ford government press releases. So as an NGO, we're doing everything we can to, um, release this information to both the public and the polit the politicians and the media. Okay. Well, Thank I can, you very much. And, and I can That's add, great. I can add as well. I mean, we can all get the word out. Uh, we can do so by writing letters to the editor, for example, or getting on social media. So letters to the editor, if, if there is front page news or editorials on um, climate change, anything, anything like that can, you can kind of, add in the you know the gas plants um definitely do that um i also just want to note that millie had a question about how to deal with reps who may be unpleasant who may be pleasant to talk to um but uh, without really listening or making space for actual dialogue or discussion um millie are you meaning that um it's kind of like a kind of a um what do you i'm, I'm sorry um maybe you can uh, explain what that is what you mean? Oh, so reciting just a party line. I think the issue here, like how to how to break that is to get personal and just start asking open ended questions. What are your feelings on this? What's important to you? So understanding what their values are and speaking. Once you're able to speak at that level, then you can have actually a human conversation with them. Um, I mean, I've been in meetings as well with staffers who don't give me anything and we ask questions and and it could be a bit of a write off, but um, that's unusual. If you're if you're actually speaking to the representative, they do like to talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you're going to ask some really interesting questions, that's a great way to start opening um, uh, to open them up to 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 the to the issue at hand. Thank you. Okay. So much, Cheryl. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I see that there have been I, I missed a few questions, but I think we're going to have to cut we, it off now. Yeah, so, unfortunately, yeah, we yeah. are now at eight o'clock and I can That's tell okay. that many of these conversations would like to continue. And we do have an opportunity to continue them. If you are able to stay on for another 15 minutes, we will have breakout sessions. If you cannot stay on, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. Um, thank you so much, Angela. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Liz, for moderating the Q&A. And thank you uh, to our wonderful tech team led by Ray. Um, there is a Google survey in the chat. Please complete the survey. Uh, we always like to know how we can continu continue to improve these webinars. Speaking of webinars, there's another one coming up on April the 18th. Um, that one is entitled Beyond Gas, Ontario's Energy Future. It will feature Stanford energy researcher, Dr. Mark Jacobson, who is the author of No Miracles Needed. It will, we'll also have Jack Gibbons from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance and Gabby Kalapos, who is the executive director of Clean Air Partnerships. And for that one, please invite your MPPs and your councillors too, because they need to hear this information as well. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those who would like to stay on, um, you will be given the opportunity to um, 
show your cameras and and speak ray will take care of all of the technical side of that and for those who have to leave now again thanks for coming and we will be sending out the slides and more information so stay tuned <laughs>